Hey everyone, it's Steve here with First Updates Now. I'm here with 8177 Vector here at the first DCMP in Texas. And oh yeah, this robot over here, clean, really smooth, and we're excited to walk through their robot with us. With them, we have Roland, Connor, Marat, and Akash. And we're walking around through the robot and excited to see what they have here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Annie Mark has parts and products designed specifically for First Robox competition and First Tech Challenge teams. Many Annie Mark staff are first alumni, mentors, and event volunteers. Visit AnnieMark.com for all your educational robotics needs. If you're attending championships, come to the Fun and FRC Discord Meetup on Thursday, April 20th from 11 to 11.45 a.m. in Conference Room 360 CNF on the third floor. We'll have games, giveaways, time to socialize, and a chance to meet the Fun and FRC Discord staff. Get a reminder RSVP on the Fun or FRC Discords, and we'll see you at championships. Roland, we'll start with you. Talk about us your intake, your wrist. It seems really small, but able to do all the game pieces. So talk us through about that. Right. So for this year, we wanted to keep our intake pretty simple and um, intake both pieces. So intake both a cone and a cube. And to do that, we went with a triple roller design with the front two rollers being for the cone and then the bottom two rollers being for the cube. And so at the start of the season, we actually got inspired by a fellow Open Alliance team, Spectrum 3847, with their dual roller prototype. And we expanded upon that to use it for both cones and cubes. And we just continued iterating upon it um, to get this final intake over here. Um, and if we want to enable real quick. So we can show off all the different presets we have for intaking. So this is our standby position whenever we're just traveling across the field. And then we're able to pick up both tipped cones, just like that, as well as standing cones, like that. And then we're also able to do cubes, just like this. Oh, sorry. And so the cube just sits very nicely in there, and we're able to eject it once we get to the grid. As for design, we went for um, compliant wheels in the front and the back, um, as they provided a lot of grip to intake the pieces with the touch and go mentality. And so that has allowed us to increase our cycle time really fast. Um, which has been great for the course of the season. And we've been improving constantly as we have competed. So from the intake, we go to the wrist. So our intake, it's able to go to all those different set positions because of our wrist. And we run it off a 32 to one Neo motor in the back right there. And we wanted to package everything really tightly so we could keep our overall chassis size and frame really small. And so everything's packaged very nicely. And it works really well, especially with all our set points, which Murad will go over later on. And I think we'll move on to the elevator. Yeah, so Connor, talk us about your elevator. Looks like to be at an angle, and how well has that done for you guys? Yeah. So, okay, so at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the year, we pretty much knew right away that we wanted to do an elevator. We're a brand new team to pick and place games. We didn't want to do an arm or a pink arm or anything that could be super wobbly. So after setting on an elevator design, we looked at a lot of other teams for inspiration. With the Open Alliance, everyone's builds are public, everyone's CAD is public. So a lot of the, well, some of the teams we looked at were things, teams like 3512, 1339, and 3847 Spectrum. Um, this elevator has served us really well simply because of how simple it is. So you can see, if you look at the bearing blocks, they're West Coast bearing blocks. And if you look at the Dyneema Ascension system, it is a thrifty bot Dyneema system. So this is what we call our Frankencott's elevator. It saves us a ton of time in having to design custom bearing blocks, custom Dyneema rigging, everything like that, which means that we could have our elevator designed and up and running within like a week. Um, and combining that with the wrist means that we get extremely smooth movement from anywhere that we want. So our elevator itself is powered at the back by two Neo motors, each on a nine to one, each on a nine to one ratio. And it has two chain drives and two Dyneema runs. This is just so that we can have a ton of redundancy. If one chain breaks mid-match, we're fine. If one Dyneema breaks mid-match, we're still fine. We can run on one of each at the same time. Um, we have about a 15 pound constant force spring pulling up our carriage because our intake alone is pretty heavy. It's about 15 pounds. So that was something that we had to design for. Conti continuing on to the overall structure right, of the elevator, we have it mounted at a 55 degree angle. And that's just with these large gussets 
and these large gussets at the bottom. This allows us this allows us to mount it super rigidly without having to worry about like a ton of bolts or anything or any pivot points, and it served us really well. Another design choice that I like to talk about is using is tube plugs versus gussets. We looked at 3512's build blog from last year, and we noticed that they use a lot of tube plugs. When I reached out to some of their students and mentors about why, they gave a lot of helpful insights for this design, such as saving time with constructing it and having more versatility with how far your bearing box can go. So that's been one thing that's really helpful for us, just reaching out to other teams and looking and incorporating that into our design. Moving down from the elevator, everything is mounted on steel gussets. These are both eighth inch steel. These down here, eighth inch steel. Our belly pan, eighth inch steel. This allows us to have a 60 pound chassis, which means we're super low and we never tip, even with that 15 pound intake that I mentioned. It's a pretty simple system and it works really well. And we have a lot of complexities in the programming that Murad can talk about. Um, hi, I'm Murad, I'm the lead programmer, and programming this ro robot this year was an incredible challenge for me, especially with the new April tags in the field. So those have actually opened up a lot, a lot of opportunities for us because we can use them to do pose estimation, which is basically getting the robot's position at any point in the field accurately. And we actually have two limelights on each side of the robot to um, detect these April tags. So this pose estimation at first, I wasn't 100% sure what we could do with it, but Thinking about it more, I was able to develop two main uses for it. First one being um, paths and trajectories for this worm drive. So during autonomous, we can use it to accurately follow a trajectory in case like the odometry on the wheels got a little bit off. These can, cor these can, correct, can, these can correct for that. And um, the other reason I found for it is um, lining up with the grid. Initially we had it. So the way that we deposited cones was from a certain distance and we would try to shoot it and then make the cone flip over midair. But we found that to be very um, unreliable in the actual field because like you have to be a very specific distance. It was, it was just not a very good um, solution. So we decided to use these limelights to distance the robot at an exact distance from the, grid, from, the, from the grid so the drivers wouldn't have to worry about it. Because it's kind of hard to see the grid and hard, hard to see the distance from the actual thing when you're behind the driver's station. So we found that to be a really incredible use. And um, yeah, so th that's one incredible thing we did this year on our robot. Another thing that we actually um, implemented this year is something called Advantage Kit which is a logging software for the robot. And through this logging software, we're able to do incredible things. Also, shout out to Mechanical Advantage 6328, and shout out to their lead programmer, Jonah, for implementing this and coding this, because it's an incredible piece of software. So using the software, we're actually able to completely log everything on the robot. It's able to log things like the wrist, um, the wrist degrees exactly, and the encoder degrees on the elevator and stuff. And using that data, we can actually simulate the code again after the match is already done and change stuff within the code as if the robot had that code and was actually playing the match. And we can actually show you all a visual, or a visual example over here. This is the driving over to the human, to the section over there to get a cone, and now it's coming back to deposit the cone. So this is actually very useful. And another use we found for this is um, driver practice. So our driver can actually look back at the footage and see stuff he can improve on. And it's, it's very useful for just like observing and you know, incrementing over the matches. So that's something that we really, we're really proud of. And another thing that we, had to implement on the robot through programming was um, set points. So the set points were very important for us because we need exact we need exact positions for the robot itself. So I can show you all some of the some of the set points. Yeah, this is cube. Oh, cube. A car. Sorry. So this is depositing the cube, and then this is cube L1. So this is for the level one on the actual grid, and then cube L2. This is for the second level, and then cube L3. This is for the third level of the cube. And from there, you can outtake. It just, it's able to place it on the grid exactly. And then we also have cone. So this is, this is ground cone intake. And then level one, which is right here, it just, shoot, it just kind of poops it out. And then level two. From here, it actually shoots downwards and shoots it onto the pole. And then level three. So we actually incremented on this from last time. So like how I said, we have to be that exact distance. We solved that by doing something kind of interesting. Now we drive up very, very close to the pole. We make the cone kind of right up against it. And then we use this sequence. So if you can activate it really quickly, it's going to spit up the cone, just activate it. So as you can see, it flicks the cone upward. So what it does is it gets the cone on the actual pole, then it flicks it upward. So it kind of like pushes it back onto the, onto the pole and makes it successfully. So that's something that's actually allowed for a lot of consistency, with, consistency within the robot and allows our drivers to, you know, make it pretty much 100% of the time. Thank you, Connor and Murad for that amazing description about 
your programming and your elevator. One thing I do want to ask about your elevator, though, is how powerful is your elevator with just one of the systems not working? Yeah. Uh, so we actually haven't tested the full upper limits of our elevator, but based on the calculations that we've done, it, the elevator should be strong enough to self-right. So about 150 pounds of downward force with just the elevator on one chain in Dyneema alone. We haven't had any issues with any chain breaking or Dyneema breaking or anything like that, even when we were running it with only one of each. So. And how long does it take to replace one side if it breaks? Yeah, so one thing that we really like having because we have our large pits now, um, we have full spare chain runs. We have full spare chain runs with turnbuckles already on it. So we can pull off the back cover and swap out the chains and put new chains on fresh in like under five minutes. It's very quick, it's very efficient because we have those full runs with the turnbuckles. That is really, really impressive. And now to hand off to you, Akash, talk about me, talk to me about your style and how clean and simple and smooth your robot is right now. Yeah, so um, I think if you look around, it's pretty obvious that our team is, um, what's the word, very aesthetically inclined. So we've uh, obviously function over form, but we did give a lot of importance to form as well this season. So our robot is completely wrapped with car vinyl that we got from uh, Visionary Auto. It's a car wrapping place near us. So our robot is wrapped bottom to top, all the metal pieces with car vinyl. That's what gives that really clean, smooth, and matte finish. Um, above that, we have a lot of 3D printed parts on the robot. So 3D printing has been huge this season. And if you look back there to our Bamboo Lab P1P, it has a lot of uh, 3D printed parts. That's actually a kicker bar that just finished. So the uh, having that rapid prototyping and having those color um, options has been really awesome to us. So I think I'm just going to point out the 3D printed parts real quick on our robot. We have an elevator gear cover here. We have our Mark IV I swerve covers. If you move around to the front of the robot, all the spacers in between the wheels are printed. All our pulleys that are actually functional parts on the robot are printed. And then our uh, wrist pivot here is also printed in carbon fiber, along with our carbon fiber limelight mounts. So 3D printing has definitely been huge this season in keeping a um, robust bot that's easily replaceable and looks great. Um, I think above that, the last thing I want to talk about is our sign vinyl. So besides uh, car vinyl, we do have sign vinyl on the robot. So our back sponsor plate here, which is tinted with car tin again, has all of our big sponsors on all of the robot's name this year, Velocity. And then we also have our main breaker vinyl, obviously, over to the side. So it's definitely been awesome seeing uh, the robot take form mechanically as well as aesthetically. And uh, it's given us a really clean looking bot. Really proud of it. Even the, uh, I think, a little known fact, we bought this grip of wheels because they were orange. So there you go. Really clean and nice aesthetic robot. Currently ranked one in Apollo. And before we end it off today, I want to know, other than stealing the moon, what is your guys' plan for this weekend? I think probably to keep that win streak going. That's the plan. All right, 8177 Vector here at the Fit DCMP. Good luck to you guys. Playing really well so far and excited to see how you guys do the rest of this weekend. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Thank you. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Annie Marcus Parts and Products designed specifically for First Through Box competition and First Tech Challenge teams. Many Annie Mark staff are first alumni, mentors, and event volunteers. Visit AnnieMark.com for all your educational robotics needs. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.